Hello, good afternoon. Chris Packham here, and today in the guise of Vice President of Butterfly Conservation, and welcome to this live broadcast to celebrate the launch of the Big Butterfly Count 2023, a fabulous piece of citizen science where you can help us get a better understanding of these remarkable and beautiful insects. Now, we love our butterflies and moths. They are fragile, they're ephemeral, we treat them as treasures in that regard. They're equally very, very beautiful to look at, but their life histories are fascinating as well. We've got about 55 different species of butterfly in the UK, a few more, counting occasional migrants from time to time. Lots of moths, the macro moths, the big ones, the ones that we like more than those difficult to identify little micro moths, about 800 of those. So they're a remarkable group of animals and they can very much act as indicators as to the wider health of our countryside. So we're keen to keep an eye on them. They face all sorts of problems. Habitat fragmentation, habitat loss, populations isolated, too many pesticides and now on top of that climate change. And that's why this year, more than any other, we are hoping that you'll join us for our big butterfly count. We had a drought last year. We had a cold, wet spring this year. We're in the middle of, well, I was about to say, we're in the middle of a drought. But here am I, hiding under a gazebo in pouring rain at the Hawk Conservancy Trust in Andover. More of that coming up later. But it, yes, it is raining today. And that might be, uh, well, not the opportunity that we perhaps wanted to launch the big butterfly count because I'm not going to be looking over my shoulder and spotting any adult butterflies but I can tell you this there are a lot of hungry caterpillars out there that are very happy about this rain because it will be refreshing their salad that they need to munch on in the forthcoming days and weeks before they pupate hopefully turning into those adults we might see later on. So we're going to be broadcasting for about an hour. We've got some fantastic guests. We've got Julie Williams, the CEO of Butterfly Conservation. Zoe Randall, one of their principal scientists, will be joining me. We're going to be taking a look at some live animals. Yes, but they're moths. We got out of a trap earlier. Uh, we've got some footage that's been sent in by you and some fascinating things to see there as well. And then lastly, I'm going to be joined by the one and only Amir Khan. Marvellous bloke, one of my favourite people, Amir, I've got to say. Passionate naturalist, obviously an NHS doctor, as you know, and a man who's very much got his finger on the pulse of how engaging with wildlife can help our mental health. So we'll have a chat about that at the end. But before we get started, I'm going to hand over to Lucy Lapwing, and she's going to tell us the basics of the big butterfly count. Over to you, Lucy. I love being outside and connecting with nature, especially when that involves seeing butterflies. And it's even better when you can contribute to some important citizen science in the process. I am of course talking about the Big Butterfly Count, and this year it's taking place between the 14th of July and the 6th of August. By taking part, you can help scientists at Butterfly Conservation understand more about our butterflies and how they respond to things like weather patterns and climate change. It's dead easy to take part. All you need to do is download the Big Butterfly Count app or head to bigbutterflycount.org. And on there, you'll find a free guide that'll help you identify what you see, or you can download a free ID guide from the website. Then you just need 15 minutes in a sunny spot. You've just got to count the type and number of butterflies you see, as well as some day flying moths, enter your data into the app or onto the website, and the scientists at Butterfly Conservation will take care of the rest. Now, if you don't actually see any butterflies, it's still really important to record that. Scientists want to know where butterflies aren't just as much as where they are. And do try not to be disheartened. We do know that butterflies are declining in the UK, but by counting these numbers and submitting the records, we can help really target those conservation measures to help them recover. So please do submit your results. Don't forget to do that. And the best bit is you can do as many counts as you want over the three week period. So if you tell your friends and your family about it, get them all having a go. You can even do one every single day because the more counts happen, the more data we get. And that's really important for the conservation of butterflies. And as well as that, it means getting more people outside and connecting with nature, which can only be a brilliant thing. Thank you, Lucy, for that introduction. Now, I'm no Robert Redford, but I am a bit Butch Cassidy at the moment because raindrops keep falling on my head. 
Who'd have thought we'd have been launching the big butterfly count after the summer that we've had to date in a downpour like this? Well, we're not going to let it dampen our spirits because immediately I'm very pleased to say that I've been joined by Julie Williams, who's the CEO of Butterfly Conservation. Julie, I'm sorry about the weather. We did everything we could to set this up and it's, it's let us down. I know. Well, not to worry, Chris. Good afternoon. And can I say to you... A huge thank you for everything that you're doing today to help us launch this such an important count. Thank you. An absolute pleasure. An absolute pleasure. Well, the Big Butterfly Count's been running for some time. Why is it so important? So we launched Big Butterfly Count for the first time in 2010. And we set the campaign up because it was so important for us to try and understand how butterflies were furring in a three-week period, the same three-week period every year. Since then, the count has grown and grown. Butterflies are really sensitive indicators of our environment. So what we know is that if butterfly numbers are dropping, that means that nature is in danger. They're also really important parts of the ecosystem. So they're both pollinators and they're important parts of the food chain. So it is really, really desperately important that we understand what is happening. That's why Big Butterfly Count is so important. And we encourage everybody to go out and take part. Personally for me, not only is it important that we collect the data, but I enjoy having my 15 minutes out in my garden, peace, solitude, and watching those butterflies fly. And my, the sense of well-being for me is wonderful. So not only is it good for nature that we know what's happening, it's also good for ourselves by doing it too. It's a piece of citizen science that's open to everyone. We have to stress that you can do this in the middle of a city, you can do it in suburbia, you can do it in the countryside, you can be three or 103 years old. And the key thing, Julie, is that you don't have to be an expert. You absolutely don't. And we have lots of resources on our website. You go to the Big Butterfly Count website. Everything you need to be able to do this is all there. You do not need to be an expert. Now, long term, as you say, they've been doing this now since 2010. They're really important when it comes to looking at trends in the changing distribution and, 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 and populations of these sorts of insects. But we might argue that this year is more important than any other due to recent weather climate events. Oh, absolutely, Chris. And what we're really worried about this year is because we, we need the data to understand how these extreme weathers are affecting butterfly populations. You already said earlier that we had really high heats last year, we had droughts, we've had very wet spring. The irony is we're also having a wet summer um, um, at the moment anyway. So we had a very wet spring. And what we don't understand yet is how these extreme weather conditions are affecting butterfly populations. So this year, more than any other, we absolutely need to understand what is happening. Climate change is only going to make extreme weather much more prevalent. Look what's happening in Europe this week with those soaring temperatures. So we need to understand so that we can find the conservation solutions to make sure that we are keeping these wonderful animals alive. And let's be clear, um, we are asking people to go out and engage with wildlife and you pointed out you know, how healthy that is, how good it makes you feel, basically. But the data that they give us is very valuable. What do you do with that data? So the data is combined with other data that we collect from many other schemes across the UK. That data, we have a whole team of researchers at Butterfly Conservation that look at that data. They, they do real, produce real evidence and research. That then helps us find solutions to turn what we have from the data into conservation action on the ground. We also share the data and that's really important to remember. That data doesn't belong to us. We use the data to influence government, we influence farmers, landowners and we are always happy to share our data far and wide so people can make decisions based on evidence. Okay, now one of the things that we know from the data and all the other survey work that you've been doing um, is that many of our species are in trouble. 80% in decline over recent years, 80% of the species in the UK, some more than others, some are doing better than others in some places. It's a, it's a patchy thing that's quite difficult to, to understand. Um, what can we as individuals do to help these things? So do the count. So that's the first thing I encourage everybody to do. Do as many as you can over the next three weeks. If you want to do more than that, we have got a campaign about creating as many wild spaces as possible across the UK anybody can create a wild space and that's around creating an environment for both caterpillars for the adult butterfly and somewhere for them to shelter 
And if you have a garden, every single person in the UK should be able to create a wild space. But it's not just for people who've got gardens. If you have a balcony, you can have a, a, a pot that you can create those spaces. And if you don't have a balcony and you can't have a pot, go and find those green spaces in your local community. Talk to the people around you. You're, create those green spaces in your local community so that you can connect to nature and create your own wild space. Lots of information on our website of how to do that. Indeed, and schools in particular, if you've got any green space in, in schools, oh, would be a perfect place to absolutely. do it. Absolutely, we have loads of information on our Discover and Learn website where you can go and for teachers and for young children where they can turn school patches of land into havens for butterflies and moths. And let's not remember, it's not just for butterflies and moths. Think about all the other wonderful insects that those schools could, could create and bring to the wild space. OK, now I'm going to put you on the spot now with a really tricky question. It's not uh, the date of the Battle of Cressy, actually. Um, it's, um, what's your favourite butterfly? And it's a tricky question because there are so many beautiful butterflies. And equally, some of them may not be as beautiful, but their life histories are remarkable. But you've got to just pick one. Oh, that you are putting me on the spot, Chris. And actually, I'm also glad you didn't ask me what my favourite moth is, because there are far too many of those yeah. to decide. I suppose if you put me on the spot, I'd say my favourite butterfly of all of them, because it is magnificently glorious, is the peacock. And for me, the peacock with its beauty, for me, it epitomises spring when I first see my peacock. And let's not forget those amazing eye sockets that actually act as a defence for those, for those butterflies. It's just amazing. Not only is it beautiful, it's also fantastic. A good, fantastic, good example of how nature, how clever nature is. Indeed, and of course they overwinter as adults, so sometimes you're fortunate enough to find them Indeed. hanging up in your garden shed where the, the, the dark, sort of almost rusty underwings yes. provide them with great camouflage. Yes. And of course, when they crack those wings open, as you say, those beautiful eye spots on the back of them. Absolutely, it, absolutely love it. But, but let's just say all butterflies and all moths, even the brown boring moths, they're definitely not boring at all. So all of them are beautiful. They're there, they've got a job to do, and we need them to do it. Do That's indeed, the, the bottom Chris, line. Absolutely. Julie, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks uh, very um, much. Peacock is, you know, is the first favourite that we've got on our list. Now, last night we ran a, a moth trap. It wasn't pouring with rain, thankfully. And so today we delved into that moth trap first thing this morning to see what we could find. Now, it's always a bit of a bonanza. You never know what you're going to find. Sometimes you think you're going to find a lot and you find it very little. The moth trap that we set last night was here at the Hawk Conservancy's meadow, at the top of the uh, hill behind me, a couple of hundred metres away. They planted a memorial meadow for the founder of the Hawk Conservancy Trust, Reg Smith, a few years ago. And it's absolutely magnificent. It's filled full of all sorts of wildflowers. You can see the gnatweed behind me there. Now, we were fortunate when we opened the moth trap this morning that it, there were plenty of species in there. Can I say the first thing is that you don't need to be able to identify all of them. Essentially, just look at them for what they are. Look at them in a childlike way, not a childish way, but a childlike way. Ask fundamental questions about them. This is a privet hawk moth, one of our largest species. But I've got to tell you, and I'm not ashamed to tell you, that, that there were plenty of moths in the trap which I couldn't identify. I mean, I kind of recognise some of them, but I've forgotten their names. There are about 800 species of moth. And here we are exploring, not just moths, you can see a painted wing fly had turned up. A couple of wasps we had to turf out of the trap as well. And there were some black arches in there, some heart and dart moths, some underwings were in there, plenty of footmen as well. And here you could see those moths hiding in the old um, egg cartons. We put the egg cartons in the bottom of the moth trap so that they have somewhere to rest out of the light which has attracted them there. And the last thing to say is that, of course, as soon as we stopped looking at those, we put them back in the trap, covered it over to make sure no naughty robins or dunnocks came in and scoffed the lot. And then we would later release them into the hedgerow so that they were safe there. Now, my next guest for this live broadcast, celebrating the launch of Big Butterfly Count 2023, is Dr Zoe Randall, one of a team of scientists who work with butterfly conservation to better understand these insects and, critically, Zoe, to affect their conservation. 
Good, Good afternoon, Chris. Lovely How to be you? here. Slightly tired and slightly soggy. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, we're not going to allow tired and soggy to dampen no. our spirits today. No, we're not. Right, what have you got in your well, box? We've got some absolutely amazing moths in here. So this is a privet hawk moth. This is the UK's largest resident moth. Let's see if you can, get, do you want to stick oh, him on your I, finger there? Oh, I'll see if I can get this, um, a beautiful animal on my finger. Amazing. Yeah. They are our largest resident moth. They're yeah. found in much, across much of the UK and they are spreading northwards as a result of climate change. And I don't know if you can see those beautiful pink stripes there on the, on the body. And there's no prizes for guessing what it, the larva eat, of course. Privet, I guess. Exactly. Yes, yes. The privet, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, this group of moths, the hawk moths, are probably for most people the, you know, the most exciting. They're the largest, they're quite flamboyant. I mean, this is a spectacular animal, isn't it? Absolutely. And the, the great thing about, I'm, I'm a real one, I'm a bit of a trophy hunter when it comes to moths. I'm not into the little brown boring jobs. <laughs> I love, I know I can't say that, but I do and I will because I'm honest. And um, yeah, the, the hawk moths for me just do it every time. And they're really great for children and people to engage with because you can see here, he's nice and cool and chilled out and relaxed and they're really good moths to you know, stick on people's fingers and, and show around. Look at the eyes in there. Now, yeah. they're made up of a, a whole collection of lenses called omatidia, which are fused into what the, we call these compound eyes. What I like is when I look at this, I have no idea how that moth is seeing you or I. I know. I, it's quite. It's quite spectacular, isn't it? To think it's probably quite. It's probably having quite a trippy experience <laughs> with us peering at it. Who it. knows? And then it's got these remarkably sensitive antennae here. I'm not going yeah. to touch them. And and it's using those to sense, you know, food plants, perhaps where it's going to lay its yeah. eggs, if that's necessary, or certainly find mates if Absolutely. there are males looking for females. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. A, an amazing animal that is. Yeah. And also, I've got to say. We're looking at it in, and you know, respecting its beauty and fascinated by its physiology. There are other species of animal that would look at this and think, what a meal. Absolutely. I mean, can you imagine? That would probably feed, feed a bird for a, a good, good day or so. It's got a really lovely chunky body on there. And um, if I was a bird, I think I might have one of those for breakfast. Yeah, I, well, we're, we're going to put this one back in its box. And then later, as, as I said before, we'll make sure that we put it somewhere where it can hide away until it gets dark again tonight and it can go and do its moth business out there, if I can possibly get it off my hand. So. <laughs> right. They do have quite sticky feet, oh, don't come they? Oh, come on, come on, come on. There we are. All right, you there? Hold on. Oh. oh, there we are. Don't want to lose a toe, do you? That's no, in, it's in, it's in. Okay, what else have you got in your magic box of moths? Well, we've got my, my utter favourite moth here, my favourite, and it's because it's pink. And we've got two of them, actually. We've got the, should I grab okay. one of those? Should I try and get one of those? Try and, and get one of those, well, yeah. Okay, so these are large elephant hawk moths. Uh, elephant hawk moths, yeah. Oh, and on. look at them. I mean, you right. wouldn't think that something like that would inhabit the British Isles, would you? You really wouldn't. I mean, look at that, that lovely pink combined with the olive green. And actually, when you do like a straw poll of the, the UK, the elephant hawk moth comes in as the UK's favourite moth. moth so, um, yeah. Art Deco masterpiece, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, totally. And of course the caterpillar is spectacular as well. I remember going into the garden, there was a pot outside of our, you know, small garden uh, a door, and there was some fuchsia in it. Mm. And I found an elephant hawk moth caterpillar. And of course, when I was a child, it was monstrous. Yeah. About the, you know, so they can grow to the size of my index finger, yeah, basically. They yeah. And they're adorned with those spectacular eye spots. Yeah. And yeah. they produce poo, which, is, which comes out like a, a pellet, a massive pellet. I loved the poo of the elephant <laughs> hawk moth when I was a child. So much, you know, big, chunky poo. Yeah. Chris Packham, the frass hunter. Oh. <laughs> That's what we call it. But frass is really important, isn't it? We, we count you know, moth frass to get an idea of the abundance of moths in springtime so that we can predict how well our woodland birds will be able to breed. Yes. So yes. we shouldn't joke too much about, you know, moth poo, no. spectacular insects. Mm. And the food plant is, I mean, I mentioned fuchsia, um, but they also feed on rose bay willow herb. That's, That's right, yeah. Rose bay willow herb and, and fuchsia in gardens. And most people, when they come across an elephant hawk moth, it's normally the, the caterpillar stage that they find and in the in sort of late late summer september time you can people see these fantastically large caterpillars crawling across the pavements and everything to uh, find somewhere to go and pupate 
And then look at that. Okay, Lovely. yeah, okay. Super well, I'll put that back in there. You get another moth out. <clears throat> That's part, it's, it's hawk moth central. So as a, as a moth trophy hunter, I'm in my element here. Oh, no. And this work. one, this is a pine hawk moth. Look at look that. At look that. at that. Absolutely pristine, really fresh, quite possibly emerged in the last sort of 24 hours. I'm going to leave that in there, Zoe, because yeah. on the white background you can see it more clearly. Absolutely. Isn't yeah. that one of the most beautiful things? Yeah, amazing. And these, these moths are spreading across the UK. They like to feed in, in uh, conifer plantations right. and they are spreading across the UK. I can't think the last time I saw a pine hawk moth, you know. I don't see them very often. I run my moth trap down in the New Forest, where there's a yeah. lot of pine. Yeah. But we don't get pine hawk moths no. there. But no. that's absolutely no. spectacular. Isn't it? Well, that's a great thing about moth trapping, isn't it, Chris? I mean, you yourself know that you, know, you might not record or you might not get a certain type of moth in your trap from one year to the next, but then all of a sudden it's like Christmas because you open up the trap and there's this fantastic yeah. uh, pine hawk moth. And the, the, the excitement when this was discovered in the trap this morning was, was off the scale. Wow, look at that. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, people are gonna say, why do moths matter? Moths matter being the name of one of your projects. So That's right. Moths are like butterflies, indicators of the health of our wider environment. They're really important food for bats and also for birds and blue tit chicks eat an estimated 35 billion moth caterpillars a year. And that's conservative estimates because that's based on each clutch of uh, each pair of birds only having one clutch of eggs. Amazing. So if they have a good breeding year, then they need an awful lot of caterpillars. And obviously if our moth number, if moth numbers are in decline, which we know that they are, there's less food available to support those nesting birds and support the chicks. When I was a kid, I'd go into the garden, suburban Southampton, and I'd find um, tiger moth, garden tiger moth caterpillars, mm. uh, the big yeah. woolly bears, as we yes. call them. And I'd love yeah. them, you know, climbing over my hands, feeling their little sticky feet on my fingers. Yeah. And then, of course, we'd find the adult moths if we left the kitchen light on. Yeah. But I, I, you know, I can't tell you the last time I saw a garden tiger. They, 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 they've vanished. There's been significant declines in our moths, haven't there? They have, yeah. Most of our moths, about a third of um, our, our moths are, are actually in decline. And the garden tiger, we know, it's one of the few that we know the cause of, of its decline. And, um, and it's, a due, it's due to climate change. Warm, wet winters um, affect the affect the survival rates of these things they're more susceptible to pathogens and disease so that's the one one moth that we do know why that one's in decline very sad, it's a beautiful, very sad. Beautiful, when they were beautiful animal a really common a really common sight for for okay, people we've got time for a couple more moths oh so well so yeah beautiful. well this one this one i love this moth i absolutely love this moth this is the first time i've seen this moth in real life okay. and when we saw it this morning in the yeah. trap i couldn't believe it it's a lappet moth. I don't know if you want to yeah. do the necessaries okay. there with it. I can get it out onto my hand. Yep. So I, I've got to I misidentified this this morning. You did. And I, I did. Was very smug. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, but I think that's important to say. Do you know what? The best thing about you know our interest in the natural world is that we are never going to know everything. Yeah. You know, and and what I like is meeting people like yourself. The greatest joy is that I meet people who know more about a subject that I'm really interested in, and I learn from them. So anyway, tell us about the, this is the lappet moth. I called the, it a drinker when I first yeah, saw it, so I'd this forgotten. this is the lappet moth. I mean, look at that. It looks, from the side, it looks like a little shrew. Um, um, unfortunately, this moth is declining across, uh, across the UK. It's primarily found in the south, from, and in a line from the Wash to the Severn in the UK. Um, but unfortunately, in the east of England and, and the east, east Midlands, the, the moth is, is sadly declining quite a lot. But I mean, look at it. It's, I mean, it's a beautiful, it's a triumph of camouflage. It so as, as opposed to the elephant hawk moth with its pink and olive green and white, this is a, a perfect mimic of a dead leaf, isn't absolutely, it? Absolutely, absolutely. And it's just, it's just, a it's the cutest moth, isn't it? It does look like a sh little shrew. Yeah. You know, it's got that sort of pointy snout. It's obviously not a snout, but I mean, you know, it's a tuft of hair coming out of the front of its head there. Yeah. But, but yeah, no, it is. Ooh, I just want to drop him. Yeah. Uh, truly spectacular yeah. piece of crypsis, we might call it. Cryptic yeah. coloration. Okay, well, yeah. I'll put the lappet back in and we've got time for one more last one moth. One more. Well, if we've got time for one more, it has to be the buff tip. Oh. The buff tip doesn't even look like a moth. The buff tip looks like 
a broken, snapped off birch twig. And if that moth was sat on a birch tree, you wouldn't see it, would you? It's really good camouflage, protects it from being eaten by, by the birds and other predators. Yeah. Absolutely lovely. It is. So I should I'll probably have to point out that this is the head end of the moth here. And the tail end is there, and both the head and the tail have this pale coloration, which is the interior part of a birch twig. It's the woody part of the twig that it's mimicking. And then, of course, that, that the silver coloration on its back it perfectly matches the, you know, the bark of the, of the silver birch tree. Again, you, know, you just can't tire of you know, admiring these things. I know, the, the variety, the beauty, they are just something else. You know, we've got two and a half thousand species of moth in the UK. And, uh, and even if, even, and it's, some people say, oh, but they're really difficult, but start with the easy ones. If you want to get into moths, start with the easy ones, the hawk moths. Be a trophy hunter like me and go with the hawk moths and the buff tips and the scarlet tigers and the jersey tigers and all of those. Okay, well, the rain's really coming down now, so I've got to tell you, everything's getting soggy, uh, including me. Uh, but before you go, a couple of difficult questions for you. Oh. Okay, I mean, although you've, been, you've already said that you're a trophy hunter, so you're going to go for a hawk moth. Favourite moth? Elephant hawk moth. Elephant elephant every hawk time moth. it's pink and it's green, and they're to my two favourite colours. Okay, okay. favourite moth is elephant hawk moth, but we're doing the big butterfly count, yep. which does include a few day fly moths, we have to say. Yep. But what about a favourite butterfly? Julie's Fav gone for peacock. Yeah. can't go for peacock. No, I'm going for the brimstone butterfly because the males are bright yellowy green. And when I see that first brimstone in my garden, normally about the 3rd or 4th of March every year, I see that flit of yellow across the garden and I just think, hooray, the winter's over, the spring's on its way, the summer's coming, long hot summer nights, apart from tonight, and uh, it's got to be the brimstone, a real beacon of hope. Yep. No, I'm absolutely with you on that one, that flashing sulphur that you see in those brown hedgerows in spring yeah, and it's yeah. shouting winter's over <laughs> good times are coming yeah. although i've got to say this year i didn't see as many brimstones as i normally do no i haven't and that's unfortunately 80 like you said earlier 80 percent of our butterflies are in decline yeah. and the big butterfly count can help us understand why that's happening and what's happening to our butterfly populations Okay, Zoe, thanks ever so much for joining us today. I think we've got a question now, if I can pick up my soggy script. Let's have a look what we've got here. So, um, we've got a question, what is the black sack? Well, we've got a picture of the black sack. And there you can see, look, there are two burnet moths. And then on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see what appears to be an opaque sack. Uh, that's the exterior part of their pupil case. And then the black sack hanging beneath it, it will be the pupil case itself. That's it. It's the, what they call pupae exuviae. So when the moth hatches out of the, well, comes out of the, the cocoon, it does a final molt, a final shed of skin, and that's the little black bit that's left there behind. Oh, nice. Look at that. And they're pretty yep. spectacular. Well, look at the antennae on those. They are. They Can are. you imagine what they smell? Well, they All sorts. They would put our <laughs> noses to shame, wouldn't they? Absolutely. Yeah, oh, they really would. goodness me. And again, you know, these are day fly moths, these burnet yeah. moths. Yeah, day fly yeah. moths. Yep. And that, that coloration is what we call aposematic coloration. So it's warning coloration. Yeah. Um, because they taste this. Have you ever tried one? No, not recently. No. <laughs> but no, they, do, do, are they on your menu? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm on my menu, no, because I can guarantee you, guarantee they would taste really bitter mm. and nasty. Yeah. Um, and very often when you pick up some species of insects, they actually um, exude a fluid. You know, like ladybirds, you put a ladybird on your finger, you get like a y little yellow spot. Yeah. Ever licked it? No, I haven't. Oh, no. come on, no, Zoe. I would imagine it the might neck. taste a bit like earwax or something like that. It's actually yeah. very, yeah. very, I've not tried earwax, <laughs> but I've, I've tried ladybird <laughs> vomit and it's, it's just basically very, very bitter. Zoe, thanks ever so much for joining us. That's oh, absolutely pleasure. brilliant. Thank I'm just going to give you a bit, bit of a recap on the big butterfly right. count because we'd really like as many of you as possible to join in this year. Um, please go to bigbutterflycount.org where you can download a printable sheet if you want to do old school with your clipboard and pen, or you can download a fabulous app which will allow you to upload your information. Then what you need to do is find a sunny spot, maybe not one here today, 
and stand there for 15 minutes and count the maximum number of each butterfly species that's in the apps. Now, that's not all UK butterflies. We've chosen a specific group of those which are widely distributed across the UK and equally relatively easy to identify. If you need more uh, you know, help with the identification, there is more uh, of that available on Butterfly Conservation's website. So you stand there for 15 minutes, you note it all, you upload it, you send it to us, and then you do it again. You don't have to just do it once, you can do it as many times as you like. But I do have one very, very important ask, and that is that if you do choose a place and you don't see many butterflies or moths, maybe you only get one or two, or maybe you get none, it's implicitly important that you send us that data as well. We're not just after the big totals. We need all of that data. And very often negative data is not posted to us. And that might skew our ability to understand, you know, how are these populations are faring. So please do join in. Butterfly, bigbutterflycount.org. Download the app on your phone and join in. Perfect to do something with the kids on a sunny spot in your garden if you have one or somewhere local and it doesn't matter again I'll say it again it doesn't matter whether you're in the heart of a city if there's a buddlier bush there um, it's worth looking at or you can be out in the countryside in a nature reserve right what do we got coming up next well we've got uh, a marsh fritillary which is absolutely perfect look at that so Vanessa Wright has sent this uh, fritillary in and she says I was gobsmacked to see my first ever marsh fritillary in the Chilterns a few weeks ago I know these have been quite rare and was wondering whether it has recolonized naturally or has it been officially or unofficially reintroduced? How would we know with any certainty? Well, that might be difficult, to be honest with you, Vanessa, to know with any certainty. Um, these are insects which exist in what we call metapopulations. Now, a metapopulation is a, a group of small populations which are relatively close to one another. I mean, they're sometimes they may be even walking distance apart and they exist in these populations, so if one of them becomes locally extinct, they can recolonize. So if you hadn't seen their one, one there before, it could have colonized locally. Um, the reintroduction programs have been done in some parts of the southwest, I, I know that, and we've also this year been concerned about some unofficial reintroductions of some previously native species. Now, I have some degree of sympathy for people wanting to rush conservation um, in the sense that sometimes our conservation programs seem to take a little bit too long for some people and they run out of patience. But can I just stress that when we do proper reintroductions, we do them scientifically and we do them properly and we make sure that there are no pathogens introduced and that the animals can't possibly do any harm to our native butterflies. So we at Butterfly Conservation say, please be patient, don't do it yourself help us do it properly. That would be the thing to do. So Vanessa, I don't know the answer to your question, but it's a beautiful butterfly. Okay, next up, we've got this one, silver wash fritillary. This is Anna Rebecca Tolua, and she sent this one. Oh my goodness, look at that, that's fantastic. I've been that excited by um, silver wash fritillaries as well. So these are our woodland species. You find them quite commonly here in good years in the south of England. Um, and they come in a couple of color varieties. There's a darker one. This is one of the lighter ones, those lovely, orange wings, upper wings there. The silver wash in their name comes from the underwing. There's a silver stripe. I know it sounds bizarre, but it's true. If you're ever lucky enough to get near one, as you can see this young lady is here and getting very excited about it, then you will see that silver wash. And they have one of the most remarkable life histories. I could tell you all about it. Probably I'd better not, because we'll be ill for the rest of the afternoon. I'm not going to tell you. I can't resist it. I'm going to tell you. So basically, um, once they've mated, the females um, fly to a large oak tree where they're going to deposit their egg in the bark where it will overwinter. And then they fly out of the tree and they fly to look for violet plants on the woodland floor. And they fly backwards and forwards and they're measuring the distance from the trunk to the violet plant because that's the food plant of the caterpillar. And if the distance is too great, they don't lay their egg there. If it's the right distance, they lay their egg, the adult dies. The egg overwinters, it hatches as a caterpillar in the spring, the following spring, and it climbs down the tree and it walks out to the violet, the violet plant which is there, as measured by the adult the year before. Now don't tell me that butterflies aren't absolutely sensational. Okay, next up, burnet moths, Rachel Norris. I photographed these burnet moths in the wildflower on Linda's farm last week. There were thousands of them. Do they appear all at once in time with the flowers? My goodness me, look at that on that field thistle. Um, 
They are and can be very locally abundant and what a spectacular show they put on. They are drawn to these thistles, I have to say, it's a good, a good place to see them. So I think what you've experienced here, um, uh, Rachel, is a, a local hatch of all of these moths coming out at the same time. And of course, you're absolutely right, it's about being able to find that nectar, then find a mate at the same time. There's no point in, you know, males coming out at different times for females, that wouldn't function, would it? So they find a mate, then they breed and they lay their eggs. Spectacular stuff. Now, I'm very pleased that uh, we couldn't come here to the Hawk Conservancy Council without meeting a bird uh, of prey. So Tom has joined us with a kestrel called Scout. Tom, thank Hello. you for coming in. It's a pleasure. Oh, what about that? Isn't she gorgeous? Oh, beyond gorgeous. Absolutely stunning bird. Oh, I used to keep them when I was a, a young man. Younger than yourself, I have to say, as a teenager. And it was one of the most amazing parts of my life, you know. So tell us a bit about Scout. Well, she's a seven-year-old female kestrel. And she's been with us practically all her life. And she flies with us on a daily basis, sometimes part of our flying displays that we've got here, sometimes part of some of our keepers' talks as well. And uh, it's really a way that we can demonstrate the apex predator of an open meadow, open grassy field, right in front of your eyes as a visitor. Something that maybe you'll see on a, a regular basis if you're very, very lucky. But Scout here has also been trained to show that classic hovering behaviour of a kestrel. And to have that happen right above your head, it's a very, very special sight indeed. And, and that's quite unusual. I remember trying to train mine to hover. Right. And they would say you have to fly them into a headwind and then you know, run under, constantly run underneath them. And there were all sorts of techniques I remember reading about. This was in the 1970s, Tom. You were not even a you know, twinkle in anyone's eye at that point. You know? And, and I, I could never get mine to hover. But I think we've got a clip of, 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 of hovering. We can have a look at some hovering, I think. And this is Scout in action. Yeah, this is Scout with Miriam, who did the vast majority of the initial training with Scout. And you can see there how she's beating her wings into that headwind, just, uh, headwind, just as you described and also fanning that tail. These kestrels have got just the most amazing tail. By, by comparison to other falcons, of course they're a member of the falcon family, and uh, that tail basically assists them as a giant air brake essentially, so they can both be full throttle using those long pointed wings and slamming the brakes on at the same time, allowing them just to hang on the breeze. Of course there's many species of birds that can hover very, very well. Not sure there's any that can do it quite like the kestrel. Don't say that for an Arctic turn because they're, they're quite good at it as well. But you're absolutely right. When, when we get close ups of their head when they're hovering, the body of, and the wings and tail of the bird are being buffeted around. The head is absolutely static. Yeah, yeah that focus just from the eyes is amazing. And just as I was describing Scout with that little bit of extra training we've done to her to get, get her hovering right above us, you can kind of get that, I don't know, vol eye view of a kestrel looking straight down at you, that, that head totally still, just as you've described. You mentioned, of course, they're birds of open country, so hovering is an asset to them. There's nothing there to perch on. They can't do what other raptors do, which is sort of sit and wait, if you like, perched in a tree, sort of goshawk style -y. Um They have to get out there. Um, in terms of the food, they've got a really very, very broad diet, haven't they? Yes, yeah, lots of rodents, lots of insects, um, occasionally other small birds on the wing. So, yeah, they're kind of a generalist in a way, I suppose. Uh, obviously, the link with what we're talking about today with butterflies, you know, butterfly larvae is very important to, uh, and caterpillars, of course, very important to other smaller birds, which kestrels may well predate upon. Um, things like voles as well, I suppose, will come along and, and, uh, and utilise that similar space. You know, it's a, we understand that although our main mission is the conservation of birds of prey, they are part of a, a wider ecosystem that without every part of that ecosystem functioning well and being healthy, birds like scout as a, an apex predator in the wild can't really hope to survive and, and thrive really. And occasionally we do see kestrels taking larger moths and, and, and their larvae. We know that hobbies, a close relative of the, of the kestrel, another a falcon which visits the UK, uh, comes back from Africa in the spring. We see them, I mean I remember watching them again back in the 70s, um, and, you know, catching lots of fox moths on the wing. So the adult of those is an important part of their food. They don't take too many to the nest when they've got young, but when they first arrive here, they're, they're, they're feeding on those fox moths. Little owls as well, course, yeah. to get them running on the ground, uh, uh, taking uh, larvae. I think, again, we might have a clip of some kestrels eating some um, insects. Do we have that? Here we are. It's yeah, photographs, in fact. Look at that. Catching in flight. That's very hobby-like, I've got yeah, to say. You see a lot with kestrels, is it? No. I think falcons, generally, we, we have this idea that they're only hunting and catching other things on the wing, just like that. But the kestrel, ordinarily, is a little different, isn't it? They're usually catching things on the ground, yeah. hence the hovering behaviour. Yeah, yeah. 
in fact, there's a bit of snobbery, isn't there? Because people say that, you know, kestrels are not the greatest flying birds. And I remember when I had my own little kestrel, I would look, you know, at people with peregrine falcons and feel rather small. But I've got to stick up for the kestrel and say that they're brilliant at what they need to do. They have a totally different niche to a peregrine, don't they? They, yeah. they do a very different job, catch very different prey and live in different, different habitat as well. And look at those eyes. Oh, I'm swooning. It's taking me back to my youth. Before you go, Tom, um, tell us a bit about the work here at the Hawk Conservancy Trust. It's, uh, there's a, a lot going on. There is a huge amount going on, yeah. We do, we've got an open visitor centre here, so people can come and visit and see the birds in flight. And that is all a, a kind of a way that we can work with birds in the wild. That's kind of how we fund the conservation and research work that we do. So come and have a great day watching the birds, but also know that that helps to fund research work with critically endangered species. We talk an awful lot about vultures, most endangered group of birds arguably in the world. Species like the kestrel, we look after with something called our raptor nest box programme and I know you've helped and supported yeah, with that yeah, yourself, yeah. putting up nest boxes for cavity nesting species in the UK. Kestrel's one of them, little owls, tawny owls and barn owls are the other um, and uh, we've got over 1,200 nest boxes now that we look after as part of that project so it's a very very important work. Yeah, so it's based but top top engagement and the uh, cafe's not bad either is it? Absolutely, really nice chocolate brownies. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent work. Tom, thanks ever so much for, for bringing Scout in. I've got to say, if anyone's going to ask me what my favourite bird is, I, I've gravitated to male sparrowhawk in recent yeah. years. Yeah, but hold on, I might be going back in the other direction. <laughs> Having got back to Scout. Yeah, thank you Tom, absolutely brilliant. Okay, but we're here for big butterflies today, not big falcon counts. The big butterfly count is running from today through to the 6th of August. I urge you to go to bigbutterflycount.org and download that app. We only want 15 minutes of your time, perfect to do with the, uh, the kids. Get out there and count those insects, send it into us so we've got a better understanding of their changing populations in these changing times. It's really important. Now what have we got next? We've got uh, hummingbird hawk moth. Jane Smith has sent us this photograph of these remarkable animals. You can see there, even from this still photograph, why they're called hummingbird hawk moths. They hover like hummingbirds. They've got that extraordinary proboscis. You can see they're coming from the front of the animal's head, probing deep down into the neck tree of that flower. Now, again, when I were a kid back in the 70s, seeing one of these was a real treat because they were principally migrants that came from further south in Europe. These days, because of the changing climate, we know that they've successfully bred in the UK and they are actually overwintering and producing their own resident generations here. I'm sorry about the rain, it's getting really, really loud, so I'm trying to amplify my voice over the uh, cacophony on the roof of the gazebo here. Next up, we've got this Jersey tiger. Leslie Berry has sent this in. Another really striking insect here with those red underwings that it will flare at you if you mildly annoy it as it would flare at any bird that was thinking about eating it. And a bird would be put off because just like those burnets, this is an animal that's offering its aposomatic coloration, saying, don't eat me, I'm distasteful. A striking species, day-flying moth. Actually, I think it's on the list this year for those species that you can spot in the big butterfly count. And then last up, we've got these, caterpillars. These were sent in by Kate Beaumont. And these are the caterpillars of the lackey moth. And you can see there that they're on a web that they've spun themselves. And they will take refuge in that web. It's quite tough. It's not like a spider's web. It's much tougher. And uh, they will shelter in that web overnight and during the uh, hotter parts of the day so that they're not eaten by birds. And they're also what we call a processionary caterpillar. So sometimes you'll see them on the trunk of a tree. I used to have them on a pear tree in my garden when I was a kid. And they go in lines up and down the tree, one following the other one's backside in a, a procession. So nice to see those lackey moths. I haven't seen those for some time. Oh, and the eye spots on the head there are not the eyes. Their eyes are much smaller and, and closer down to the bottom of the head. Now, as I promised at the top of our little live broadcast today, I'm very pleased now to be joined by Dr. Amir Khan. Hi. 
my Chris. Oh, it's nice to be here. oh, I know it is, it is, but <laughs> honestly. The weather's not great, oh. but it's great to see you and it's great to be part of the butterfly camp. Thanks ever so much for coming down. I know you're really, really busy and you've come a long way to join us today. So I'm sorry about the weather and we'll have to project our voices I'm over. From up north, Chris, this is what we're used to. Don't worry. <laughs> it's not great for the, the tourist boards up <laughs> north. True, true. It's okay, It's beautiful up north. Come up north. OK, okay. go on then. Right. T tell me about your relationship with butterflies. You're a very passionate gardener. I know that. Megan, yeah. my, my stepdaughter, has been to your garden. Yes, she said she it's has. an oasis. Oh. An oasis is what she <laughs> said. Right. It's not a big garden, but we, we do the best with what we've got. Uh, and right from the start, when we moved into that house, we decided we wanted to make a nature friendly garden and starting right at the beginning, really, the basics with the plants that we've got there, getting those insects in. And that's where the butterfly side of things come in. You know, we we know. Well, again, you know, I haven't got a background in, in nature or anything like that. I know about the well-being side of nature, but I read a lot of books. Uh, and, and looked a lot of things up online about in terms of, you know, what kind of plants are best to attract pollinating insects like butterfly. And we just got them in and planted them I in. Mean, lots of plants died along the way, Chris, I'll be honest with you, but not some of them green, survived. <laughs> Hold on. Perfect at helping humans survive, but not quite so good with plants. Not then. so well, but I found kind of a, a, a balance, I think. <laughs> And your garden is, is very diverse. Well, one thing I've noticed when I've seen it on TV, of course, and, 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 and Megs has shown me, um, you've got lots of stuff growing low down, yes. shrubs and trees. You've got yes. a lot of structure there, which is good for wildlife. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So again, we're looking at what we want to attract because we know it's a whole ecosystem. Uh, and, you know, if you get the insects in, other things will follow. But having that structure is super important. So the lower, lower down kind of shrubs and plants, great for insects down there but kind of the butterflies like some of the taller plants uh, so at the moment we've got verbena growing in and flowering and they love that the buddleia are just coming out uh, and we've had uh, as well as butterflies we've had a hummingbird uh, a hawk moth as well so um, really incredible but you know it also attracts the birds and the bats which have been brilliant this summer as well. Oh, you mentioned Buddleia there, which is not a native species. Not, no, it comes from the Himalayas, essentially. Uh, it was discovered by a guy called Bishop Buddle. Oh. That's how it gets its name, Buddleia. <laughs> Bishop Buddle, what about nice. that? And he found it growing in uh, dry riverbeds. But it's a species that's naturalised here in the UK. See it growing out the side of buildings and everything. Yeah, Produces yeah. masses of nectar. Mm. But I if you've got that in your garden, then I guess you've not gone the, down the sort of snobby, you know, no non-natives route. No, no. I just plant what I like the look of. Uh, and if they've got, if I'm down at the garden centre, which is pretty much every day, then uh, if it's got one of those kind of bee signs on the plant, I'll buy it and see what it does in my garden. And if it attracts something great uh, and I'll get more of it. Uh, so I'm very kind of, I'm an enthusiast, not an expert when it comes to gardening and wildlife. In the past, there was, there was a degree of snobbery where it had to be sort of native species only. Yeah. But then a study was done by a lady called Dr. Jennifer Owens and she published a remarkable book, OHS published it. And she counted more than 2000 insect species in her Leicestershire garden. And so she not only did an audit of all of those species, she's found species new to the UK as well. So she was a, a brilliant entomologist. But the other thing that she's discovered was that many of those species had adapted or were able to use non-native plants. So this prescriptive thing that you've got to have just British wildflowers isn't true. No, no. I think nature is in such a state at the moment, particularly here in the UK where we're so nature depleted, anything that we can do to help British wildlife is, is going to be important. So I think snobbery and restricting that is, is, is never going to be good. We've got to adapt uh, and do whatever we can, really. Indeed. indeed. Now, you touched on it uh, uh, earlier. Uh, mental health, natural health, basically, yes. um, is something that we both uh, you know, know the benefits of. We, yeah. we, we go and actively seek it. Uh, tell me a, a bit about how that manifests and how important it is, particularly for your patients. Yeah, it's really important. I work in a very inner city, socially deprived area uh, and a lot of the patients I see are have mental health issues a lot of it is re related to kind of poverty and and, and social inequalities uh, and part of that social inequality is not having access to green spaces in the same way that perhaps more affluent people do uh, and it's really hard to kind of get a feel a palpable kind of feel for that and quantify it but we know scientifically that spending time in green spaces is great not just for your mental health because we talk about mental health as well but your physical health too uh, and when people are deprived of that because we've evolved around green spaces and nature you know a lot of our physiology is tuned into 
you know, what's around us now, not just the, the plants and the animals, but just something simple as sunlight is, is so important to our sleep cycle, to our immune system, uh, to our um, uh, happy brain chemicals. All of those things are so finely tuned to our natural surroundings. When you take people out of them or you deprive them of time in nature, it has an adverse effect on their health. And when there's so many other factors also having those adverse effects on people's health, you know, it, it, it really takes its toll. So one of the things I'm really passionate about, and you've got to pick your timings when you're talking to patients about it, uh, because they're not all receptive and it's not always the right time in that first There's consultation. There's scepticism as to this actually being scientifically it's proven, isn't it? It's, it's proven, it's completely proven. We know, I mean, if you're going to be completely prescriptive about it, spending two hours a week in, in green spaces has been shown to improve your mental health. So you can spend half an hour on average each day. Uh, and I think as people get busier and busier and we get m more disconnected through kind of televisions and screen time and that kind of thing, people are missing out on that. But they don't know it intrinsically. They'll feel it, but they may not know why they're feeling the way they do. But it, there shouldn't be any scepticism anymore. You know, it, it makes sense. The science proves it. We know our physiology proves it as well when we're outside. Like now, even though it's raining already, you know, just being out here, our serotonin and dopamine levels are going up so we feel calmer but really importantly our stress hormone cortisol starts to come down and that only not make that only you know it's not just making us feel relaxed that cortisol level coming down now with us being out here will mean tonight we'll have a better night's sleep because cortisol is one of our waking hormones and if we bring it down towards the end of the day you know we will have a better night's sleep as well so it's it, and sleep is so valuable to so many health aspects so it's so important people do and i'm really passionate about that social inequality and getting people from all backgrounds out in nature yeah. mm. um, my lowering cortisol is uh, off, unfortunately offset by two wriggling poodles when it comes to sleep so <laughs> it, uh, fair enough yeah. <laughs> but are you gonna you, you know hugging your poodles will also bring your stress levels I down that. I definitely, I that. <laughs> definitely um what about personally i mean try and describe how it makes you feel you're in your garden you've created that garden so there's a sense of empowerment there you've done yeah. something good for nature yeah. and, um, and we deserve to pack ourselves on the back for that you're out there in a quiet moment you see something you've never seen before or, or something that is exquisitely beautiful you've always wanted to see and how does it make you feel oh it, it's amazing so normally my, my time spent in the garden is after a busy day at the surgery so you know you you see stuff and you talk to people who who really have it hard and so it, that all of that takes its toll on your own mental health uh, and so when you come home, the first thing I do is go into the garden because you just walk around the back and it's, and it's there and it's like an oasis for me. Um, and every day it changes, every single day. So there'll be something new that, that I, will, I will see. Um, my favourite thing, it's not really a butterfly, but my favourite thing are the bullfinches in the garden. And they are just so, they've got so much personality and they're, they're, they're so beautifully coloured, particularly the males. Uh, and now they're bringing in their young into the garden and showing them the feeders, which is, again, it's, it's like you say, it's that pat on the back. You say, oh, I put that feeder up and now they're bringing their next generation along. Uh, and it, 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 it's astonishing to see because they're so beautiful. But that, that stress and that kind of wound upness that I've got from the day at the clinic starts to just kind of dissipate in time and then going over to the pond and if they if it's still warm enough and there's still frogs in there uh, that's always lovely it's always lovely because again you know like lots of my patients I didn't grow up around nature you know we didn't have family holidays in natural spaces or anything like that um, so having this now at this point in my life everything still feels fairly new and everything feels really exciting uh, and any change and any new thing that I see there is it just feels incredible because it's not something I've been used to growing up uh, and so I just love it I just love it okay are we coming close for you being able to in your professional capacity prescribe natural health I mean, in the sense, when it comes to mental health, most people perceive that it's pharmaceuticals. You know, you're going to go there and they're going to give you something which will change your, change your brain chemistry and may achieve results. But there's sometimes a cost with those sorts of things, and I don't mean the cost of the drugs. Um, so yeah. it, are we coming close to that point? I think, I think when you're dealing with anyone with mental health issues, you've got to take a broader approach and a holistic approach to their mental health. So talking to them about what might be best for them and having time in nature and green spaces is part of that holistic approach 
and and everybody's treatment um, and and kind of management of their mental health will be individual to them. Uh, and it's important that they know what the evidence is and what might what the options are there for them. So if you're just saying to them, oh, have this tablet and you might feel better, but these are the side effects, you're not doing them any favours because you haven't explained, well, there's this available and this available and this available. We have to say time outdoors uh, in green spaces or natural spaces has been shown to be as beneficial to your mental health if you're suffering from mild to moderate anxiety and depression as medication. That's what the evidence shows. It doesn't have to be instead of medication. It, all of this can be bolted onto other treatments, talking therapies and all of that kind of stuff. None of it has to be done in isolation. I think if you're dealing with anything as complex as mental health, you have to take it from all approaches. The medication, the talking therapy, the time outside, all of that social interaction that's important for people's mental health not one of those things will work by itself for a lot of people. It's a combination of things. And we do talk about um, time in green spaces with our, with our patients. And I think as we learn more and more about it, you'll find more clinicians doing the same thing. Fantastic stuff. OK, I'm going to challenge your mental health now <laughs> because I'm going to ask you a very difficult question, which I've asked uh, a couple of other people. Uh, it's the favourite butterfly time. It's, I, know I know someone's already said this, but I've got to say it. It's the peacock butterfly. That's, I know. <laughs> well, it's, it's what we see the most in our garden. And again, I think just because it's got those big kind of giant eye patterns on its wings, I always used to associate that with insects from more tropical climates. And to have it here and have it in my garden, just amazing. So, yeah, it's the peacock. When they freshly emerge and you get a close view of them, they've got that lovely velvety mm. texture to the wings. The colours yeah. are so intense, so aren't intense. they? So intense. We had a year, I think it was three or four years ago, where there must have been a really good year for peacocks. And, uh, and our Buddleia was just covered in them, covered in them. And we used to go out and they were just there kind of gently kind of flapping their wings like this. And it was amazing. They were, they were must have been about 40 or 50 on our, on our Buddleia all at once. And it was just, just wow. Okay. Right, yeah. top stuff. What are you up to next? Um, well, I'm going back to Leeds. <laughs> but in terms of next, I've got um, a few projects coming up. I've got a book coming out uh, in September, which is not nature related. It's about, uh, it's a novel, How Not to Have an Arranged Marriage. Uh, and I've got a few shows for Channel 5 about dogs. Actually, you're a dog lover. Yeah. We've got one with Claire Balding coming out about how to stop your dogs from getting lost and what to do if you've got a lost dog and how to find lost dogs. So that's exciting yeah, as well. Yeah, well I mean, I have all, always anxiety about losing my dogs. That's the key thing. Yeah, I mean, for yeah. me, they're part and parcel of that. Well, they're the whole centre of the family, of basically. Course. So yeah, yeah. I have a close companionship bond with those. Oh, I look forward, forward to, to Earth as well next week. Earth's next week, yeah. yeah. Oh, five hours, a biography of our planet. That was, no, that was no mean task. <laughs> I cannot <laughs> not wait to see it. Four and a half billion years into five wow. hours. Anyway. Somebody told me you, you said something today about this rain not being that bad because it rained for two million years. It did. In the Triassic, yeah. We're not entirely sure why, uh, but they've recently discovered. So there's lots of new science in that programme. It doesn't mean we've got all of the answers, but it's certainly, you know, uh, telling us some new things about the history of our, our Earth. And, uh, you know, the, the objective of the programme really lies in, with everything that you've just been saying, you know, we're so fortunate to have this wonderful planet. Mm. It's the only one we know of where there's any life. Yeah. It's exquisitely beautiful. Yeah, yeah. When we allow it to be, it's functional. Yes. And then there's ourselves. I mean, I know we do some really bad things, but we are still a remarkable species. And the idea that we're here at this point in time, in this one beautiful planet, we should cherish that. Absolutely. Everything's so fragile, we, we've, we've got to look after it, including our butterflies, of course. Definitely. Definitely. Thanks so Thank you. Sorry about that. I, I, you know, I can't apologise <laughs> enough to be called. It's been two million years. Yes, I'm hoping it'll just last a weekend. <laughs> Quite, and listen, look, as I said earlier, the caterpillars are going to be loving this because everything's going to be a little bit greener from now on rather than brown as it has been down here in the south of England. Right, OK, last chance to tell you how to do it. It's really important that you take the time, if you can, to join us for the Big Butterfly Count 2023. So go to bigbutterflycount.org. There, you can download a sheet with a few butterflies and some day flying moths on. You can pin it to a clipboard and go out to a single spot where for 15 minutes you count the maximum number of each of those species that you see. Or you can download a fabulous app, easy to interact with and log the information, which you can then directly upload to Butterfly Conservation and their scientists will crunch your data. The purpose behind this, I think, is principally twofold. Firstly, 
We want to know what's happening to our butterfly populations and their distributions in the UK so that we can be more proactive and practical when it comes to conserving them. And secondly, as Amir has just hinted, it's really important that we all spend more time engaging with nature firsthand. And we know that when you switch off from the rest of the wider world, you can find some solace and respite in nature. And 15 minutes looking at butterflies with you and your family is a perfect way to do that. So please do take part in the Big Butterfly Count 2023. And even if you see just a couple of butterflies, or maybe you do a count and it absolutely hammers down, you see no butterflies at all, we really want that data as well. So you don't have to just send it in if you see 50 really spectacular species. If you see a couple of little brown jobs, well, none at all, we really need that data as well. And I promise you that by the autumn, butterfly conservation would have crunched that data and we'll be reporting on what's been happening to our butterfly populations over these extraordinary periods of the last couple of years. The drought last year, the cold wet spring this year, and now, I was about to say the drought that we're in, in the south of England. But I can't say that because it's been pouring with rain. Thank you very much for joining us for this live broadcast. All the details are available on that website, bigbutterflycount.org. Thank you very much.